What's good everybody, it's been a while. I felt the need to take a break cause life has been pretty hectic to say the least. But I suppose it was for the best cause I had a lot of time to think about what to cover next. And obviously as the title suggests, today's lesson is in Theological Philosophy Part 2, The Hierarchy of Being. Of course this is not only theological as you're gonna go through a couple of sub-elements, logic, mainly modality, normology, physics or whatnot, and the main topic of the video is gonna be the philosophy of ontology. Now when you think of being, what's the highest property or being that you can conceive of? Is it higher dimensional beings? Beyond dimensional beings? Forms from Plato's theory of forms? Or absolute infinity? This is not only what ontology is concerned with, but ontology is also concerned with the study of being in itself not just the ontological hierarchy. Hence today, ontology is a big part of what's going to be covered in this video, as I'll be explaining to you my hierarchy of being for my studies of various views of what it means to be God in ontology. Starting up first is finite beings. Us finite beings, we exist not just a subset of God, presupposing that God exists, but also as a subset of nomological laws we are confined by. These nomological laws as a term is just synonymous with the laws of physics in short. You can regard them as logical laws of science, and I'll be explaining the distinction between logical laws and nomological laws, as one of them is a subset of another, when I'll explain what a necessary being is. Us finite beings are confined by the temporal dimension and exist in three dimensions of space and a separate dimension of time. It's easy to see just how inferior we are to nomology in its entirety, as finite beings such as animals, humans, and many more are far inferior to the magnitude of the universe itself. This isn't even where nomology stops, as nomology extends up to higher dimensions. The perfect analogy to demonstrate the nature of higher dimensions from lower ones is by appealing to n-dimensional spaces or including n-spaces or vector spaces. Space can be defined in vector calculus as a set where elements are called points, whereas n-dimensional spaces are just spaces where the points are n-tuplets of real numbers. A one-dimensional space will be mathematically visualized as r to the power of 1. Suppose you have a two-dimensional space called it a hyperspace it will exist as r to the power of 2, where we have functions from r to r in a two-dimensional space denoted for as r to the power of 2. The thing about this is any r need never to be thought of as finite, as explained in the absolute infinity video where I explain the nature of Alice by appealing to the real number line. In short, the open interval between 0 and 1 and likewise 1 and 2 is an uncountable set. This means for any dimension x, the second dimension is uncountably superior to x, represented as x to the power of 2. This time x is just denoted for us and tuplets of real numbers, x being r to the power of 1 to x to the power of 2 which is r to the power of 2. Explaining in a more non-mathematical way or more layman terms, like appealing to empirical descriptions, we can use the dimensional analogy. If we hypothetically had a high dimensional being, they'd be depicted as beings with godlike powers. Another thing to remember is cross sections because high dimensions embed themselves into lower dimensions. For example, with two dimensional spaces, we'd have two separate axes perpendicular to each other, which these lines, when treated as lines at infinity, provide a closure to a plane of existence. So a two-dimensional space essentially isn't a two-dimensional space without the first dimension. So if you had three dimensions of space, the second and the first would be vector subspaces of the third dimensional space. This pertains to the cross-section analogy of higher dimensions. Hence why when we have a two-dimensional being perceiving the three-dimensional being from their lower dimensional plane, because they can only hope to fathom two dimensions and not anything beyond that, they can only observe the two subsections of the entire three-dimensional being, which are denoted for as two dimensions that the three-dimensional being embed themselves into. There's a lot more to cover about high dimension, but that's another video for another time, as time passes by and I must get on to the next. I know these are mere first parts of the video, so bear with me if you find them complicating. It gets easy as we get past this, trust me. If you have any more questions, you can add my Discord, ask, and I'll respond to Theoretical Toxic as seen up there. Now, nomology can only extend up to low R reversal. I know there are a few misconceptions about how Hilbert space cannot be scaled, but that's another video for another time when I make a video, a complete video, in fact, about dimensionality but the explanations beforehand should be sufficient for you to get the general idea of dimensionality itself. Now what actually goes beyond nomology, the answer is simple. Absolute properties like forms from the theory of forms or absolute beings and even archetypes. Now what is an absolute being? 
It's a being free from all bounds, not bound by anything else, a self-sufficing being, an independent entity. This being is well and truly superior to all extensions of the material world, that which are confined or are relative to nomological laws themselves. Such a being is typically thought to be immaterial, not confined by the concept of change induced by spatial and temporal properties. As nomologically speaking, change can only occur when spatial and temporal properties exist. Even in Ming Hossi's space-time diagram, change occurs in time t in any coordinating side of x, y, z, and that is to say, change occurs in time frames of the universe with time organizing the events linearly and space allowing for the events to take place in specific positions. Because this being is immutable and not subjected to change, and can cause change despite predating spatial and temporal properties, this being can create nomologically impossible feats, which speaks of the being's divine transcendental nature over nomology qualitatively. All of this change stuff is generalized even to higher dimensions in nomology. As such, a being of this caliber is well and truly superior to all extensions of nomology. Such a being is typically, or would be typically, placed at 1A or outerversal. Typical examples of such beings are the Brahman. That's if we disregard the negative theology as a result of Nirvana existing beyond that, which in itself is a contradiction to negative theology itself. Properties relative to such beings are forms from the theory of forms as they also exist beyond all extensions of the material world, as a spatial and atemporal properties archetypes form by God in Plato's views of God's existence. Not only are they not subjected to change and are responsible for the material world which mimics them, but for these similar reasons, just as the absolute beings are, they should be out of soul inherently. Since we are on the topic about forms, we shall move to another topic that is closely related to the forms themselves. That is a perfect being. A perfect being is synonymous with infinite being in ontology a being possessing every possible conceivable perfection, beyond things with any possible conceivable imperfection. In Plato's views, such a divinely perfect being exists as the highest being in the universe, the most perfect of them all, responsible for the existence of forms or so-called archetypes, or commonly known as platonic concepts in the power scaling community. As the passage itself says, God fashions reality with eternal forms and archetypes, the order and purpose of the universe is limited and imperfection inherent in anything material. As such, a high dimension being material nomologically speaking, such a god is quite easily out of reversal. This is as low as you can get him because you can get him even further than that. Going by the descriptions themselves, such a god can exist even beyond archetypal mathematics and possibly even beyond all possible roles which have conceivable limitation and imperfections. At the lowest interpretation, it's around universal and beyond platonic concepts. At the mid and high end, the interpretation gets them beyond or relative to absolute infinity or quite possibly a necessary being, which is anywhere from universal to boundless on VSBW, which disclaimer, I do not scale according to their standards for the tiers rather than the tiers themselves for Vs. Battle Wiki. In my wiki, such god are usually defaulted to universal and are arguably high universal plus or 1T. Speaking of high universal plus and tier 0, what comes next is absolute infinity. Not much is to be covered here as it is a collection of all sets in the von Neumann's universe. To get a better understanding of it, you're free to watch the absolute infinity video I made which covers it in full detail. For yet it should be easily tier 0 and for my wiki high universal plus. Reaching towards the end of the hierarchy, we get into something that's practically logical omnipotence. A necessary being. A necessary being is a being from which all contingent beings come forth from. Such a being exists as a necessity for all of reality, modal logically speaking, it exists in all possible worlds and can influence all possible worlds themselves. To clarify this, this isn't mere nomological possibilities for example such as all possible quantum outcomes actualized in Manuel's interpretation theory as explained in my quantum mechanics behind Nasover's video and my many worlds interpretation theory that I made not too long ago. This is far beyond the scope of nomology. As I said, I've explained the difference between nomological laws and logical laws. Well, it's quite simple actually. Nomological laws are a lower end subset of logical laws. In fact, every mathematical formal system is a subset of logical laws themselves, as they require the laws of first order and second order logic, and first order and second order logic semantics, which is a subset of logical laws. 
To get a better understanding of this, we must speak of modal logic, specifically the S5 axiom for modal logic, which states that proposition P be modally possibly true means that proposition P is necessarily modally possibly true. This means that there's a possible world where P is true logically speaking, and all propositions P are only logically possible if they don't contradict the laws of logic. Anything logical is logically possible. This necessary being we speak of can influence all of logic by extension all of mathematics as we know it. It doesn't do that, but you know, it's just capable of such feats. That's just it. A typical example of this is the goddess of manifold from the manifold verse. However, it's not all of it. Earlier on, I asked you what was the highest conceivable property or being in the universe, or in everything. The truth of the matter is, such a being is typically inconceivable, as a being of that caliber is far beyond conceivability. Lessons in the highest being of my ontological hierarchy, the pure being. There are many examples of pure beings in philosophy and religion. The one from Neoplatonism, Ansof from Kabbalah, Tao from Taoism. There are even examples of that in fiction. The soul of the root from the Nasuverse, self-reference engine, and God from Unsong. Hegelian philosophy teaches us that pure thought can think pure being. A being in absolute indeterminateness. A being that's not differentiated from pure not being or absolute nothingness. Such an indeterminate being, confusion of something and nothing, of being and not being, of positive and negative, of affirmation and denial, can only hold to be conceived by our finite minds as an objective correlative of and similarly absolutely identical with its subjective correlative that is pure thought. Such beings are transcendent of all duality of subject and object, all determinateness of knowing and being, all distinction of thought and thing. Such beings of modes of thought and existence transcend all human comprehension. Beings that exist beyond the framework of logical possibility and logical impossibility as an extension having divine ineffability, being unknowable in any way, shape, or form. All one can hope to do is conceive of all that which it is not, as one cannot hope to speak of such divine ineffable beings. The notion of silence stems from the ineffability thesis, which in simple states that for any P, all affirmations T or not T are not P, but even the affirmations that they are not P is not P, and not not P. No affirmation, positive or negative, applies to beings of this scale. They are far beyond anything that we can conceive of ontologically. Hence, the ineffability concludes that the only possible solution to such a dilemma is silence. Silence as such that no predicates apply to such beings, as they only serve to limit such beings. Should be boundless in my wiki, and should be boundless on VSBW as well. Hope you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and subscribe for more content, and see you in my next video about dimensionality. Catch up.